All right, very good. So welcome back. Um, so what we've covered until now today was I walked you through the story of quantum noise. The quantum noise in LIGO has two parts. It has the shot noise and it has the radiation pressure noise. I showed you a technique using squeeze light where we can actually improve the shot noise limit. And if we could get frequency dependent squeezing, which I showed you one experimental demonstration of, then we can also improve the radiation pressure noise limit. Now, uh, the me towards the end of the, the last hour, I introduced you to the idea of radiation pressure. And I asked a question. I asked the question of, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And I showed you Carl Caves' paper, which says, oh, it's a bad thing. This is a noise source. Now I'm going to show you. Uh, some of the useful things that we can do uh, with radiation pressure. Uh, the, and, and then we'll eventually come back to the fact that it's still a noise as well. Okay? So I showed you this sort of whole zoo of, of devices that people use. And in all cases, you, what you see in the zoo of devices is some kind of movable movable mechanical element, something that, that's got a mechanical mode, and that couples to light. So to do that, let's zoom in onto a very particular uh, version of this, these experiments that I already int introduced earlier, which is a fabric mirror cavity with one mirror that we just assume is big, heavy, fixed and another mirror that's movable. And then the Fabry pro cavity has a laser beam. It bounces multiple times, et cetera. All the things you already learned about from the Fabry pro cavity. But now we're going to ask a slightly different question about this cavity. We're going to ask the question of what kind of forces does this movable mirror experience? So here, what I've done is I've drawn the resonant curve of the cavity. What this is is basically the power inside the cavity as a function of cavity length. Or if you keep the cavity length fixed, you can also just sweep the laser frequency. Okay, And the same, it will be the same, same idea. So as you sweep the laser frequency relative to the cavity resonance, it maps out this, this curve. Now the radiation pressure force, this is known, known, known to us uh, you know, uh, 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 since the turn of the previous century, is proportional to the laser power. If you, just, if you recall, radiation pressure force is actually very simple. It says this P over C, power over the speed of light. So you can turn this power just into radiation pressure force. And now what you see is two things that ha happen. Imagine I s could operate my cavity at this point right here, so on this side of the resonance. We call this the blue side, just because it's, it's the side where the laser frequency is more blue than the, than the cavity resonance. It's, it's higher. Now, look what happens. If I'm sitting right here, and by, I, I push this mirror, I, I do something, I apply some force to this mirror to make the cavity longer. The, the, that means we're going down this curve over here. As we go down this curve, what happens to the power? It gets lower. What happens to the radiation pressure force? It gets smaller, and it pulls the mirror back in. So I push the mirror out with whatever I, I want to. The light pulls it back in. Ever heard of such a thing? Spring. This is an optical spring. It's just it's a Hookean force. It's a force that's, that's proportional. It has a real spring constant, which I can, I can calculate based on the light power and, 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 it's, uh, and, and the parameters of the cavity. Now, add to that that when I push this mirror out with my finger, the light bounces many, many times in this cavity. That's one of its purposes. So there's a delay time between the time the mirror moves and the, the light can respond. And that delay time, if you, in, in, again, if you've, you've, if you've ever dealt with the harmonic oscillator, is just a damping term, because it's an imaginary term. And so you have both a force, a, a restoring force, and you have a velocity-dependent damping term, all coming from the light. OK? Now, there's one l little uh, detail here which is that it turns out, because of the, of the, of the way that the, the, the phases are arranged in the cavity, that on the blue detuning side, you get a restoring force, but you get an anti-damping force. The sign turns out to be wrong. Okay, So this is a case where you have some, a, a, a restoring force, 
which does exactly what a restoring force would do. We push the mirror, and the mirror push pulls back. But it's an anti-damping force, so the, the, the damping of your mirror goes down. If you have whatever mechanical damping, it subtracts from that, becomes less damped. And if, you, if your optical anti-damping is too big, then your mirror will, will be a runaway process. It'll just, motion will just grow exponentially, and the cavity will break. Okay? Now, on the red side, you have exactly the opposite because of the signs. You, instead of a, a restoring force, you have an anti-restoring force. And instead of an anti-damping force, you have a damping force. So what in the world is an anti-restoring force? So you can just think of it in terms of frequency shift. A restoring force essentially will pull the frequency of your uh, oscillator. It's, it's now, you can think of it as a coupled oscillator. There's the, there's the spring of the natural uh, spring, the mechanical spring the oscillator is coupled to, and this optical spring. So the restoring force actually moves the frequency to higher, whereas the, the anti-restoring force will move it to lower. Okay? So the cavity now acts, can act like a, a potential. This is just basically, it's a Hookian potential. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a potential that depends on, on x squared, the displacement, right? Okay, did I teach you something new again today? <laughs> I mean, come on, you guys. I mean, have you ever thought of this? An optical cavity can make a spring? But we use it. We use it for something rather fun. Uh, many, many applications. Yeah. Uh, in a uh huh. Uh -huh. Should be on the right hand side. But as you said, when we uh, try to unlock uh -huh. the mirror, it's somehow breaking at a distance. So since that distance uh, between the mirror and the left hand side, the uh -huh. uh, cable is the important part for the breaking, isn't it? And shouldn't that the spring, mechanical spring drawing should be on the left hand side? I didn't follow that at all, but I, the answer is no. And the answer is no simply because if the mechanic, I mean, it can be, look in many of these structures that I showed you, the mechanical spring isn't in one direction. Look at this, this is a trampoline. So the, and the light beam hits pretty much exactly like my laser does. It hits in the middle of that mirror, and the mirror from its mechanical spring can flex in both directions. So the spring I drew is just a cartoon. Okay, but uh, so, and, and in fact, the only, uh, the only mode you care about in these experiments, or you'd like to care about in these experiments, is just the mode that's along the optical uh, beam. Yeah, we might talk after, because I didn't quite follow what you were worrying about. Okay. So. In, I mean, in the case that I'm talking about, the damping, Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. No, that that uh, that certainly will depend on the conventions that you use. That's, that's why I was very clear to say for us, it's blue. We call it blue detuning. You know. So, okay, good. So now we know that we can use this as a force. This is just a picture of what those forces look like. You know that in, in if you have a complex spring constant, the real part con uh, uh, corresponds to stiffness, and the and the imaginary part corresponds to damping. So this just shows in in a, in a graph the thing I said in in words. Here is the intracavity power, and here is the real part of the spring constant. You can see it's positive and therefore restoring uh, on the blue side, and and vice versa on the red side. Okay, so. So that, that's that's that. so. What can we do with this? I'm going to just show you. Please ignore these little detailed things here that I've, I've I've written. Look at this 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 plot here. So this plot is the green curve is the advanced LIGO design sensitivity, and then every one of these other colored curves is what we would get if we detune the cavities of advanced LIGO and make optical springs. In them. So remember, what's the knob that we have to turn? And, and normally, when I operate the, the LIGO cavities, I'm sitting right here uh, on, on, on resonance. That's what we do. But if I could detune blue or red, and in this case, blue because I want to make a spring, I can actually change the shape of the advanced LIGO curves. And now notice something rather remarkable. Remember, I had introduced to you the SQL, the standard quantum limit? You can go below it. Now, why can you go below it? You can go below it because what we are doing, remember early on I told you radiation pressure couples uh, amplitude fluctuations into phase fluctuations, and that's a correlation. And when you make a correlation, you get squeezing. 
And that's inside the interferometer you're making squeezing. This is the correlations between the radiation pressure noise and the shot noise that do, does that. So I, I've, uh, I, I promised you that the standard quantum limit was not a limit. And here, at least in, in, in principle, it can be surpassed. Okay? But more importantly than that is that if you can, just by changing the power and the detuning of the cavities, you can change the shape of this curve. This can have some astrophysical benefit. And the astrophysical benefit is that imagine I have the green curve, and for some reason I hear that there is some, maybe a pulsar, that's, that's singing away uh, at 80 hertz. And so I can then tune my interferometer to be this cyan curve or this dark blue curve. I've given up sensitivity at these higher frequencies, but I have increased my sensitivity here. And that would allow me to look with, with much more sensitivity for target sources. OK? That would be the idea. Now, we don't do this in advanced LIGO uh, at the moment. And the reason we don't do this in advanced LIGO at the moment is that that coding thermal noise comes right around there. And so it, it, it would wipe it out. So until we can make better codings, this, technology, this idea is, is a good idea, but it won't be useful. Okay, But the principle is really remarkable, again, that we can create these correlations and thereby make a measurement that's, again, more precise than ordinary uh, Heisenberg. Again, we're, re we're redistributing the noise. right? And this, this is done without adding a squeezer. This is just by tuning the interferometer itself. It's inside the interferometer. Yeah. Oh my goodness, uh, 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 astrophysically interested people always ask us this. So you, you're thinking of this idea that can you track a source maybe? Well, but yeah. So in practice, if you didn't have the coding thermal noise, in practice, detuning a single cavity is completely straightforward. Detuning the five coupled, the four coupled cavities is a nightmare. So you, you, I, I will, I'll say the answer is we have not spent any time thinking about the control scheme to do that because we haven't needed to. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a fundamental problem. I think it just has to be solved. But so I don't know the answer to your question other than that we don't know, we don't plan to do that, and we don't know right now. Okay. Good. So here is one way in which you can use radiation pressure to do better. Okay. Um, uh, oh, let me skip this uh, and this. Um, all right, well, I'll, I'll spend a minute or so on this. So this is just showing you the, the, the advanced LIGO sensitivity and putting on there some, you know, the frequencies at which we would be able to, to do certain kinds of astrophysics. And the one that I want to point out to you is that this is the astrophysics we've been already doing, which is uh, populations of, of binary stars, so binary neutron stars, binary black holes. And that spans this frequency band right here, right in the lowest part. It's called the bucket. We call that the bucket. And that's the thing we've been already doing. Now, it turns out that if you wanted to look at, at the tidal disruptions of neutron stars, those are happening in the very last few orbits of the neutron star binary around each other. And that's happening at, very high, at higher frequency. And in fact, for GW170817, we didn't see that merger, because by the time they were merging, the noise is starting to come up again. Okay, so when you do these techniques of tuning the, 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 the response, the shape of the curve, you're targeting different sources. That's, the, that's the, the, the message to take away. So astrophysically, it is a powerful technique if we can get around the other noise sources that are in the way at the moment. Okay? Um, okay, so now I'm going to tell you a sh briefly about a, f uh, about a few of the experiments in in, in, in my group, the three that I had already pointed out to you, we have, the, we have these nanomechanical structures. Then we have a structure that's you know, about the size of a coin. It's a, it's a one gram mirror. And then, of course, we have the 40, 10 and 40 kilogram mirrors. So 10 kilograms was initial LIGO. And I'll show you data from that. And in each case, you notice something rather um, peculiar. Every one of these structures is a pendulum. Okay. No surprise, LIGO has a pendulum, and so we try to simulate these experiments. So what's the goal here? The goal here of these experiments is to try to do in the laboratory to recreate the conditions of LIGO. So what, what 
are the parameters we need to deal with. On the one hand, so let's start with let's start with advanced LIGO. Advanced LIGO has 40 kilogram mirrors and a megawatt of laser power. So what we try to do is, and that's what the, that's where the, the light coupling is going to come from. Remember, the light coupling, this optomechanical coupling, is the, how much can the mirror move be moved by the force of the light, and so that's mass and power. And so what we do is we try to recreate that with a, a one gram uh, mirror and and. Uh, kilowatts of power, power. and then uh, also in these, in these uh, uh, nanogram systems where we can use microwatts of power. And these are all different scales on which we can do uh, 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 different tests. Uh, so let me start with the gram scale mirrors, because the gram scale mirror experiments uh, set up a, a new technology for us that is now widely used in, among all those, those uh, mechanical, optomechanics <laughs> experiments I showed you. So what we set out to do is to make an optical trap for a mirror. Now, the optical trap for, for a mirror means you have to be able to, to remove energy from the system, right? So here is an experiment. It's a fabri pirot cavity, a one gram mirror hanging like a pendulum. And there's only two things you need to know. Busy, busy plot, but there's only two things you need to know. You can ignore everything to the left of this. Just notice there are two colors of light coming into this cavity. And we arrange these two colors of light so that one color is detuned blue to give us the optical spring, the trapping potential, and the other color is detuned red to give us the damping. And between those two things, we have two continuous knobs to take our mirror, optically trap it, and cool it. Okay? Trapping is, is the optical spring, cooling is the damping. All right, and so now I'll just show you the, 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 the results. Um, you can, uh, let's ignore the left side for now. Let's look at the right side. Now you're used to seeing plots like this because I've shown them to you before. This is a plot basically of the displacement per force of the little movable gram scale mirror, which is part of an, a bigger cavity, okay? And the mechanical resonant frequency of this object is about 100 hertz, so it's off the scale here. The scale here is, is, it's a, is, is starts at like 500 hertz. So it's a res mechanical resonance here, and that's this dashed curve. And then as we turn up the optical spring, look how the, the frequency is shifting to higher and higher. What we're doing is we're taking this floppy mechanical oscillator, and we are tying it more and more strongly to the optical field in the cavity. And at the very last one, the most, at the stiffest we could make it, which is this, this red curve here, we, we have the equivalent of 10 to the 6 newtons per meter of optical force on that, ca uh, on that mirror. So if you think about what we've done in this case, we have the cavity, and we have this little mirror, it's hanging like a pendulum, and here is this optical mode. What we've done is that we have, along this degree of freedom, we have coupled this mirror so, so strongly to this optical spring that its one hertz pendulum resonance is irrelevant. It's tied completely to the five kilohertz optical spring. You can think of this as a new spring that we formed. And in fact, it's so stiff that if I had replaced this optical beam, it's a meter long optical beam, about a millimeter in diameter, if I had just somehow been able to pluck it out and replace it with diamond, I would not get that spring constant. It's stiffer than diamond, okay? Now, would I ever want to replace it with diamond? Uh, I'm not even talking about just the expense of finding a meter long piece of diamond. I would not want to, because remember, diamond is a mechanical object and it has thermal noise. And even if it's a high Q mechanical object, it has thermal noise, whereas a laser field is a zero temperature bath. So what have I done here? What I've done is I started by coupling this mirror to a room temperature bath, this particular mode. And then by stiffening it up with this optical spring, I have decoupled it from that bath and coupled it to a roughly zero temperature bath. I've cooled it, okay? And so that was the first dem demonstration of an all optical uh, trap for a macroscopic object. This mirror, by the way, is about the size of a coin, so it's not, uh, it's not an atom. Uh, just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, real, a real thing that you can touch, feel, eat, 
um, you know, et cetera. Uh, and this was actually uh, 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 you know, set off uh, into motion a number of experiments in our group and in other groups that I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll run you, you through a few of them. So you can ask, well, when you do this, how cold was the, the, the mirror? Now, I want to be very clear. If you put a thermometer on this mirror, it would be at room temperature. The question you're asking is, how cold is it along this degree of freedom? In other words, when you do equipartition of, you can say, 1 half kx squared is equal to k sub bt. That's the, 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 the question you're asking. And so the temperature associated with the motion of that mode is what we can measure in these experiments. And what you f see is, um, uh, oh, I missed one piece of data, but that's fine. I'll, I'll go with this one. Uh, the coldest that we got this mirror to was from room temperature down to under one millikelvin. Now, if you ask what this means, this means that, and you haven't done anything cryogenic. Remember I told you we don't like cryogenics in, in, with vibrations, right? So what this really means is, oh, if, if, you, if you ask what this temperature corresponds to, you can also say, well, KBT is equal to some number of quanta times h bar omega, which is where omega is, is the, is the uh, um, frequency of the oscillator. So you're asking, how much energy does it have in, in, in its thermal, thermal energy versus its quantum energy state? And that's about 35,000 quanta, OK? Now, the reason why we're limited to these, these, this level here in this experiment, which was in our lab, is that we were, we were limited by some amount of frequency noise and some amount of shot noise. So we said, well, we know an experiment where the frequency noise is much better than we have, and the shot noise is much better than we have. So we repeated this experiment in initial LIGO. And in initial LIGO, the reduced mass of the four optics is, is, is 2.7 kilograms. We did the same optical uh, cooling experiment there. And you notice that there, at the minimum, at the coldest that we could get this, so you can see this is the, the optomechanical mode being damped, 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 damped to the minimum, which is the limit of our, 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 our noise. And it had about 200 quanta. Now, what does this mean? It means when this number went down to one quanta, this would be an object in its quantum ground state. A 10 kilogram object whose motion was reduced to its, its zero point fluctuation wave function. Crazy, <laughs> crazy, yeah. No, 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 you have to hold the applause till we get to one. <laughs> and we're going to, I'll show you in a moment. Okay, so here's radiation pressure being used to do something that isn't particularly useful for LIGO, but it's very useful for anybody who wants to do quantum state preparation. We are now showing that you can take human scale objects and you can put them into quantum states. We are not there at the, at the true quantum state yet, but that's the path, OK? All right, so that was a, a nice thing. So then we actually um, looked at um, so this. Um, brings me to the, the next topic, which was the, we wanted to directly measure quantum radiation pressure noise. This is that same radiation pressure noise I've been talking about that's in advanced LIGO. Now, why do we want to measure this in our labs? Because advanced LIGO will see it. Maybe it already is. We don't know, right? Why do we want to measure this in our labs? Because there is a number of proposals out there for improving it. But we can't test any of those proposals till we have a test bed where we can actually measure it. Okay? So we set out to, do a, to also directly measure it in our labs. And for that, we did that on in, 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 in our nanogram scale experiment. So again, you see here's a fabric pyro cavity. Here's the little, the little nano resonator there. Um, and this is a, you, know, you can ignore all the, all the details uh, of that. And now I'll show you what, what we have. This is what we had for the, os the, the oscillator. It has a frequency of a few hundred hertz. It has 100 nanogram mass. It's made of aluminum gallium arsenide as a mirror, this little, this little nanostructure. Uh, the, uh, and what we measured here, this is a very busy plot, but I only want you to notice two things. I want you to notice that at, at um, these frequencies right around, you know, above 10, 10 kilohertz or so, the blue curve, which is quantum radiation pressure noise, goes above 
the red curve, which is the thermal noise. And th this is a, these curves are the sum of these. So we have, for the first time, a structure, uh, a real a mechanical structure that's where it's, whose motion is dominated by the quantum radiation pressure. As I already told you why you should be excited about that. Anybody remember? What does this say? What's moving this mirror? The vacuum. Right, exactly, spooky, right? But that's what it is. So now Scott whispered something that's also true. If you are dominated by this quantum radiation pressure noise, then inside of this cavity, you should also be squeezing the light. For the same reason I said before, we have those correlations. Okay, and I'll come to that in a, in a moment. So that was nice. We, we've just, that was a recent, uh, a, a recent uh, uh, result from our, our group. Uh, so now, when, let me just talk a little bit about going beyond advanced LIGO. Um, so I think uh, what we're in the middle of observing run three. Probably in another, another year and a half to two years, we'll start observing run more, two, more than two years from now, because observing run three goes till March of next year. The community is already thinking about the question of how can you do better? And what does it mean? So I want you to pay attention to the bottom left plot here first. This is a plot that you're used to seeing now, frequency versus strain amplitude spectral density. This is advanced LIGO's curve right here. And all these other curves are possible designs for future detectors. And notice something important. The curve that goes down, the second curve below advanced LIGO is called four kilometers. And that's the best you can do with a four kilometer long detector. And after that, you get to the point where all the technologies that we can think of can't make improvements. And then comes the time that you have to turn the one knob that hasn't been thir turned for the last 40 years. What is that knob? Length. You've got to go longer. And so we're starting to think about 10 versus or 10 to 40 kilometer long, uh, long designs. And so this black curve shows us what's possible with, with technologies that we already know we have and making the detectors longer. And I mean, not already have, technologies we know we can develop. So it's not, this is a, is, these are not speculative designs. If you could make it longer with technologies that we have available to us or can predict we should, that's the black curve that we should get. Now, the advantage of doing that is something that I write on the, on, on, on the right side, which is that if you can achieve this black curve, then you can actually measure all binary neutron uh, star coalescences out to about a redshift of six, and binary black hole um, um, uh, uh, coalescences out to a redshift of, of 10, which, by the way, it more or less maps out the, the, the visible universe, because we know the first stars are at redshift of 10, right? And, and it also allows us to, uh, to think about, about an, an event rate for supernovae, where we can see them out to about 20 megaparsecs, or which would be about two per year. At the moment, we, uh, our, our sensitivity to supernovae is more or less uh, 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 galactic supernovae. And we know that in the galaxy, uh, uh, supernovae go off about once per 100 years. So that's a long time to wait, even though it, you know, it, could, it could be any time. But, uh, so, so that's what the, the advantage of doing this is. Now, there are many, many options to consider. Length is one of them. So it, could you go 10, to 10 kilometers or 40 kilometers? And the difference really is whether you're, you're European or American. In, in the US, there are actually, it's possible to find 40 kilometers of, of, of land that can be used. In, the, in Europe, it's not. Okay? And so that, I'm, I'm being slightly facetious, but you know, that, the 10 kilometer design is, is the one the Europeans carry, the 40 is, is the American one. It's also possible that you, we might go underground or into caverns or caves or salt mines, and that helps you with that Newtonian noise problem that I told you about yesterday. Uh, you could also do Newtonian no noise subtraction. Factors of two to three are achieved in the lab, so that would help us get that down. Now, there is certainly another knob that we, are, we, we could turn, which is for thermal noise, which is the temperature knob. And remember, at the moment, we don't do any cryogenic cooling in LIGO. And, and of course, that means we have to deal with the vibrations. The, as we, if we cool, for, in, for certain, we'll have to move away from glass and to some other material, like maybe silicon. 
Then there are also questions of whether we build a single detector that's broadband and can measure at all frequencies, or do we build uh, 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 some detectors that do low frequency measurements, some detectors that do high frequency measurement. And now you're equipped to even know how to design one. If you wanted a low frequency detector, what you would do is you would use low laser power so that the radiation pressure noise is not a problem. Or if you needed a high frequency sensitivity, then you would use high laser power. And in all of these designs, people carry uh, 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 squeeze light injection as a technology that's now carried in all of these from you know, somewhere between 10 to 20 dB. Now, I will tell you, I wrote 20 dB here because I see these designs in, you know, uh, in, in, in the literature. Uh, I don't believe 20 dB is possible even on the time scale of, of second generation, uh, uh, third generation detectors, which are roughly 20 years from now. And that's because of that loss problem that I told you about. But, uh, so. All right. So w because squeeze light injection is, is, is part of all of these, these various designs people do, and because we might, we'll be very likely changing the material we make our mirrors from, we'll also have to change the wavelength of our laser. And that means that the squeezers we have now won't cut it. They're, they're very point designed for the wavelength we have, because that's what the nonlinear materials we use are based on. So we have now also are working on making a squeeze light source that works at all wavelengths. Now, what do we need for our squeezer? We need it to be broadband, and in the LIGO band, basically. So it has to work from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz. We would like lots of squeezing. We'd like it to be more than 10 dB. We'd like it to operate at room temperature. We'd like it to operate at every wavelength. We'd like it uh, to be compact. Now, the first three, th four things we already have in hand. The squeezers I showed you do those. They don't do the other two things. And so using an optomechanical system would solve that. So how does an optomechanical squeezing work? You are used to this now. Here's a fixed mirror, and here's a movable mirror. Here's a fabri perot cavity. You start off with, the, with just the, the ordinary coherent state, the laser state, with equal uncertainty in, in phase and amplitude. So the amplitude on photon number fluctuations creates a force that's, uh, that's uh, applied onto the movable mirror. The movable mirror moves because of the force. The radiation pressure causes it to move. That motion causes phase. And that causes a correlation between phase and amplitude. Right? This is a process I've walked you through before. So we took that same experiment I showed you where we saw the QRPN. And, I, uh, and we changed how we do the readout, because measuring squeezing is a little different. And same reflector. Here was the cavity parameters. You can see that the cavity has a high finesse. It has a finesse of about, about 11,000, the mechanical Q, et cetera. And here is an optomechanical squeezing. Again, 0 dB is, 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 is the shot noise limit. Anything, anytime you go below it, you are squeezed. Anytime you're above it, you are anti-squeezed. Long, long part of the ellipse versus the short part of the ellipse. And so we've now also made optomechanical squeezing. So we are already getting ready for the third generation detectors uh, in terms of the, the quantum technologies. Okay. All right, so I'm going to leave it there for quantum. I think you've had lots of, of quantum delights this afternoon. And now I'm going to take you right back from the, from the future of, of these third generation detectors that are 20 years away to what's going on in LIGO and Virgo now. And let's just spend a couple of minutes on that, and then we'll open up to questions. So uh, the current status is that Observing Run 3 began in April 2019 for both LIGO and Virgo, and they have, they have the greatest sensitivity yet. Virgo, I, I, I meant to, and I forgot to put in a plot of the Virgo sensitivity, but here are the LIGO, two LIGO detector sensitivities. You've seen this, this curve already. This is what we had for O2 versus what we have for O3 in, in, in Louisiana and in, and in Washington. And I already told you that we have event triggers of, of, of roughly one per week compared to one per month. So this run will continue on for um, uh, uh, through May of next year. Now, what were the major improvements? The first improvement that, and the one that I've already told you a fair bit about was the squeeze light injection. We also increased the laser power by some amount, uh, by, by, uh, by a, a, a handful of watts. We had to damp out parametric instability. So I'll tell you what a parametric instability is just because you now almost know what it is. I just have to name it. Remember what I told you about when you have a mechanical oscillator 
and it can be, if you drive it with light at the right phase, you can actually anti-damp it. And when you anti-damp it, you could actually overwhelm the mechanical damping by the optical anti-damping, and it becomes an undamped oscillator, a runaway oscillator. And we see that in the nephrometer, and so we have to damp those. Uh, so we did. Uh, now here's a really fun thing we did. We actually had to replace a couple of mirrors um, and the reason we had to was we had some mirrors in the interferometer that were scattering photons. And here is a phase map of the mirror we had to replace. Look at this. Do you see this pattern here? Can, you, can everybody see that? This pattern here comes about from the process by which the mirror was made. It sits in a planetary, and it's being coated with all the, the material that makes the high reflective coating. And somehow that didn't work out right. This is what it really should look like. And so the, this mirror was replaced by this mirror. We also um, mitigated some stray electric fields, and we increased the reliability uh, of, to earthquakes. It's, it's a more regular pattern. Yeah, no, this these this these ridges are scatterers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 you just you had a lot more not not quite point scatterers, but more sort of diffuse scatter from from it. Point scatter is still a problem. And and, and the thing that we'll get we fix next. But um, but but yeah, so it was just it was basically you can think of this as because it's a scatterer, uh, it, uh, it it acts like a loss. Basically, right. we were not able to get the 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 buildup of the power in the arms to where we needed it, where, where it was with the other arms. Okay, so so those were the major improvements that were 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 done. Now this is a very very busy busy plot. I just want to put it up here because I feel like you are equipped to look at it now. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, you know how to read uh, 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 amplitude spectral density versus frequency. And some of this long list of noise sources you actually know about. The red is what we measure. The black is the sum of all these noises. The blue is the quantum noise. And then you can see this whole list in the dots and crosses. These are all various technical noise sources, including the residual gas, which is the, no the, the noise from whatever molecules are left in the vacuum system. And what you see is two things. At high frequencies, we completely uh, uh, fit the, the shot noise model, so that's good. At low frequencies, ASC stands for alignment sensing and control. We are limited by the alignment system. And in the intermediate frequencies, we don't know. OK? So that's where we're at. Uh, what's coming next? is as a global network. And the schedule for the, the, the global network is, I, I've put it here is, if you want to read it. This is us right here at this arrow at this moment in time. Observing round three is go, going on right now. These numbers, by the way, in megaparsecs are simply a, a, a figure of merit that we use for how far out could you see a 1.4 solar mass neutron star binary with a signal to noise ratio of eight. Okay, that's just, it's a benchmark number, but it's the same for all these, so you can compare. So there's, there's LIGO in observing run 3 and Virgo. You can see Virgo is a, 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 a roughly about half the sensitivity of LIGO. And the plan is for Kagura to join, that's the Japanese project, to join uh, in uh, the end of this year. Uh, and then um, we're preparing uh, for observing run four, which will be, which will be uh, in, in 2021. And then A+, plus, which is this upgrade that's, that's just been funded for a major upgrade. Not a major. It's, it's actually a, an intermediate level upgrade. It'll, it will make the, improve the sensitivity of the detector by about a factor of two. Okay? And then LIGO India should join sometime in the 2025 uh, time frame. So there's this global network of detectors you've, you, that I've just named, the two of LIGO, and they've been operational since 2015. Virgo first came into operation, Advanced Virgo first came into operation in 2017. Uh, Kagura expects to, be, be, to join an observing run in late 2019 to 2020. LIGO India should come on the air in uh, 2025. Now you might ask why we have this big network of detectors. You know, why do we need so many? So here's a nice way to, to think about this. Uh, I don't know, Scott, did you show the peanut? Okay. All right, you didn't show the peanut. This is the peanut. Okay, what th this is, is here is an interferometer, 
And this shows the sensitive, the directional sensitivity of the interferometer. It basically says it has its greatest sensitivity when a gravitational wave comes from directly overhead, and that's been said many times. It has no sensitivity on the bisector of the two arms. For uh, This is for a plus polarization. And it has reduced sensitivity along the arms. So if with this kind of sensitivity, if you want to pinpoint the location of a source on the sky, you have to do it by triangulation between multiple detectors. A single detector will not tell you very well where something is, where, an, uh, where, where a source is. And so here is a, 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 a curve that was made to motivate why LIGO India should be part of the network. So this is a network where you have Hanford, so uh, Livingston and Virgo. And this, these uh, spots are, so you can see red crosses are places where the network has complete blind spots. In this part of the sky, localization is very poor. You can see large patches. Here, localization is pretty good. And if you add India, you go to this. Okay, so the localization becomes much better. So, so that's the motivation for having a global network. Kendrick, yeah. Back yeah. So we talked about this, and there were some questions about it. Uh, you would ask me about this as well. When the binary neutron star went off, the fact that Virgo didn't see it told you you were in those little dimples. That's what we meant by that. Yeah. Essentially, um, you were very close. To the <coughs> yeah. And that's why it was pinpointed yeah. so accurate. And the dimples are even more interesting because the, the rate of change, the slope at the dimple is so steep compared to at the top that it localizes it even better. Yeah. You know, so. It's rare you can get that. Yeah. Those are the occasional moments where you get really Right. Very good. So look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up by just telling you the prospects for, for uh, uh, we have a you know, brilliantly warped and dark future ahead of us. Uh, the current detectors are zooming along. The future detectors are on their way. Scott told us about LISA that's coming on, on. So I think in terms of detectors and detector technology, it's a very good time uh, to be working on this. If there are people who are interested in these problems, there are many to still solve. So even though I'm, I gave you this very rosy picture, I didn't tell you about all the things that don't work. <laughs> so, so, you know, you know. Show us a big <laughs> Why well, did show us a row, a row of question marks? Yeah, yeah, very good. So let me not forget that you know uh, uh, the LIGO scientific collaboration and Virgo uh, are a big collection of universities and a funding agency, etc. Et and then I just want to say I. I've put up a list of readings and, and viewings and things that you guys might find interesting. So I'll just really quickly just say, uh, for GR, here are a bunch of nice, uh, of nice uh, uh, resources. Uh, for, for interferometry, I already told you about Salson's book here and Weiss's original paper. And then here's a couple of, uh, there's a nice review article that came out in 2015. Uh, for low frequency noises, for vi vibration isolation, mirror suspensions, I've just listed the different things. You can find all of these on, 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 the, on the web for thermal noise and for quantum noise. Okay, So these are just resources. I think these slides are going to go up somewhere on a, on a website somewhere, so you don't have to, to you know, wildly take notes. So thank you for listening. Questions? Yeah, so let me just say that's a very good question and, and, and astute observing. So, jitter noise. Yeah, so where you see the blue curve, the blue dots are beam jitter. And was that? Yes, yeah, so what that is, is the beam jitter is, is the fact that the laser doesn't point in the same direction and at, in, in a fluctuating way, right? And the re this is a known technical problem with this laser. So it's something that should and will be fixed. So yeah, there's a problem with the NDI laser. Yes, that's, that, 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 that's right. And, but it's better than, 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 than the high power oscillator that was there for observing run two. So if you ask why we were not able to increase the laser power between observing run one and observing run two, this beam jitter problem was, was, was worse in, in, in the previous, in the high power oscillator. Yes, and is there a specific 
1064? Yeah, so that's a good question. Why do we choose uh, 1064 nanometers as our laser wavelength? The reason you do that is that you actually have two, three, maybe four, but two important requirements on what your laser should do. The first is you need a laser that gives you enough power. And if I told you already yesterday you have lasers that do give you more power, like you know, CO2 lasers. But you also need a laser with a very narrow line width. Because remember, the wavelength of the laser is the tick mark of your ruler, right? So you, you want that, that to be a, a stable. And so when you put those two requirements together, these solid state lasers were the best. And then 1064 nanometers was the, the uh, the wavelength at which you got the best power and stability. Is it possible to prevent looking fluctuations from entering the interferometer? You know, no. So you can't block them. There, everything is an emitter. Are we yeah, so you, the way you, do, you, you would do it is you would just have to squeeze it. Remember, blocking it would be, would be violating Heisenberg. So you can't do that. Squeezing doesn't violate Heisenberg. Squeezing just redistributes the noise. So, no. So, is this type of engineering research also carried out by Virgo independently, or you are in a joint venture? Yes, and yes. So um, Virgo has, you know, does many things very differently than LIGO, but it's also very collaborative. We're, we're, there's a lot of discussion and, 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 and uh, collaboration in terms of we're stuck on this problem. Can, you know, you know, what, what have you guys seen, uh, et cetera. So it's a little bit of both. So. Lisa? Lisa has, I think, run pretty independent of the ground-based detectors in terms of actual engineering designs. A place where, where, where there's the most cross-fertilization to LISA is that a lot of students who train in the ground-based detectors may go work on LISA. And so they take these ideas. They will, they will do, oh, so, oh no, LISA is not going to squeeze. Uh, Lisa is not going to squeeze for for you know for a number of reasons. One is it would be very painful to put a squeezer in space, but the other reason is look by the time a, a laser beam travels you know a million kilometers, there's only a few photons left, right? So Lisa is 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 is, is going to be sort of not radiation pressure noise limited at all, and at the shot noise limit, it's just that's what it is. They're using a te the plan is a 1064 nanometer laser that's already been space qualified, so, so it's a two watt laser. Is that squat? Yeah. Two watt, no. yeah. Well, depending on what's available, they might go a little bit higher to just push the shot noise down a right. little more. But yeah, I, I mentioned that number actually. So when it reached the interstellar gap, the spot about 25 kilometers across. <laughs> so you're just picking up a few photons, right? What what is the actual power that the that comes on the detector? Is it like nanowatts or even less yeah. nanowatts? Yeah. OK, good. Other questions? Are there similar challenges for the, the third generation of detectives? Can you compare the large antennas to find the closing explorer? Yeah, so that's a good question. So what, you know, what are the, the, the big challenges for the, the third generation detectors? So look, I think there's, there's a couple of things. The first is when you make the, the detector longer, um, your spot size gets bigger, which means your mirrors have to get bigger. Now, from the, the radiation pressure or force noises point of view, that's a good thing. Heavier mirrors means it's harder to move them. Uh, but in, in terms of manufacturing, that gets harder. So that's uh, certainly something uh, uh, that we've had to think about. Once you get to that big of a vacuum system, there's a lot of new, new kinds of engineering that has to be done. You could just do it the old-fashioned way, but it becomes too expensive. So, because you know, so you that, there's that, that's a, a big issue. Um, the the vibration isolation is pretty secure. It has to you have to do some you know detailed work to make sure that you can support the bigger, heavier mirrors, etc. But the vibration isolation, seismic isolation, is not really uh, a, a, a big challenge. Um, and and then there's also the the question of how much laser power can you handle? You know, because again you you might want you now that the mirror is heavier, you can put more power in there for the same radiation pressure. But then all the other 
laser power problems come to get you, the absorption scattering. So, so there's, it, uh, all the, the, the noise sources that I, I listed here have to be reevaluated for third generation. That's really the way to, to, to answer it. Some of them scale with length. Uh, it, it, some of them scale in a funny power of length. Some of them don't scale with length. So it's a, it's a very, making those noise curves I showed you is a, is a, a pretty big exercise. kind of exercises you uh, presented here, like laser pushing and its response and so on, I think they should have applications to this project Starshot, where they aim to sail to a new star by laser shots with large things. And I hope they are really aware of what you are doing. I, I think. I think that these ideas would, would not be very applicable. And for the main, the main reason is that there is no, I mean, everything I showed you is cavity enhanced, which means we, we use the optical cavity to enhance the, the, the laser power that, uh, or the optomechanical coupling or the phase sensitivity. And you don't have that ab ab ability in space. In, in space, you basically have a laser beam uh, that, that, you know, pushes your satellite and and that's it right so so i think i mean i think that the idea of radiation pressure is of course the, the common thing and of high power lasers as a common thing but these ideas of actually you know optomechanical ideas that i showed would probably not have much direct application so oh wow, good i <laughs> thank you <laughs> Yeah, so Lisa's noise budget is quite different than, than LIGO's. It, it has one commonality, which is, of course, the shot noise, because photons are quantized whether they're on the Earth or in space. Uh, but then, you know, Lisa doesn't have a lot of the, 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 um, uh, the, Earth, the terrestrial noises like seismic and, 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 and vacuum, et cetera. Lisa at that low frequency is actually limited by acceleration noise, which is the, the, the fluctuations in the acceleration of the spacecraft around the proof mass. And, so, and Scott showed that. Maybe you want to say something, Scott? I'd also say there's, there's no suspensions in Lisa. There you truly are freely floating in all mm -hmm. things. shares the orbit of the Earth. And so it actually is pretty close to the same temperature. You know, if you, if you mm -hmm. get in thermal equilibrium in a spacecraft at that point, you come to somewhere near 300 Kelvin. So it's in roughly the same thermal bath, but the coupling is very different at that point. So um, it, it ends up, because of that, you don't have these various resonances that are coupled. So do you expect any kind of noise because of the that gravitational force difference between the detectors? Uh, you mean between the different detectors? The, the space stations, uh, the spacecraft. Uh, sufficiently far away to know, but it's interesting you should say that. Um, one of the major sources of uncertainty in making the noise budget is actually, so you have this freely floating test mass inside a spacecraft. And you might, you know, the perfect instrument would just be a free floating laser and a free floating thing that could be out of that, right? But that's unlikely to work. And so you have to build this whole spacecraft that goes around it. And so a major source of uh, uncertainty in the noise budget is actually the gravitational attraction of the test mass to the rest of the spacecraft. Um, and so one of the reasons that I, I, I mentioned that this Pathfinder mission that worked as well as it did uh, went over its budget by sort of the traditional factor of pi, which is typical for most space missions, but it was sort of spooky how close it was in this case. One reason for that, uh, one reason it ended up being so expensive is that they had an incredibly precise mass budget for every piece of equipment that went on to this thing. So, you know, every time they put a new screw into this thing, they made sure they knew its mass and its location absolutely carefully. In several cases, they would put a counterweight somewhere else so that they could balance out the Newtonian attraction between the test mass to this seven gram piece of metal. If while they were doing that, you know, they had to remove a shaving of metal. They took the mass, that little piece of shaving of metal, so they knew exactly what that was. Um, and that's one of the reasons, actually, was why it ended up going so far beyond the projected sensitivity, was that they measure all those things as sensitively as they did. Mm -hmm. 
So enter, enter of everything. Okay, gravitation wave hit the detector. Mm -hmm. And you have your straight transfer power minus 21, something like that. And you have very, uh, you, you have your fringes at the detector or the detector, right? And it is almost dark, but it's not dark. So you mm -hmm. can identify that uh, intensity mm -hmm. difference. So what type of detector you use in the detector? Oh, PD, right? it is. Yeah. Is oh. it an avalanche PD? Uh, no, it's not an avalanche PD. A PD is a, a photo detector. It is, in our case, it's an Indian gallium arsenide. It's a, it's a, so it's, it's a semiconductor. And basically, it, it's, it, uh, it generates a photocurrent. So when photons hit the, 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 the surface, it generates a, a current. And then that current immediately goes into a, into a low noise amplifier and gets amplified. It's really, you know, so I'll tell you a, 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 a funny story about that. So uh, many years ago when I was a postdoc, I, uh, I was a postdoc at Caltech and and Kip Thorne came by to, to our lab uh, to, show, to, to, to give someone a tour. I think it, I actually think it was like one of the, uh, 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 the queen's sons, one of those, those princes. I forget which one. <laughs> uh, so, um, so Kip comes by, and so, so you know, I was in the lab, so I'm, I'm showing them around. And so uh, at some point, I come to, to the anti-symmetric port, and there is this photo detector. Is, you know, it's not just the diode itself. It's, it's, it's actually a big box like this, big shiny box, and so on. And I, and I say, well, this is, the, this is the, the, the moment of truth here. This is the device that measures the gravitational wave. And Kip was really offended. Kip said, no, no, no. The heart and soul of the device is the test masses. And so, so it was very interesting, because for me, this was it. If, you, if your photo detector doesn't work, you better go home. But for Kip, it was general relativity. If your test masses aren't, aren't, aren't working, there's going to be no measurement. So you know. So it was a, so yeah, but it is just a photo detector. <laughs> well, if there are no more questions, then I, I have one piece of bad news for you. You're going to hear from me again in a little while. <laughs> but otherwise, you know, uh, so, uh, okay. good. No other questions, please. <laughs> Thank you.